welcome to our Lunch and Learn today. We're here to talk about the power of confidence. We're here to talk about a really important subject as it pertains to not only our professional lives, but our personal lives and really the opportunities we put in front of ourselves from really here on out and how we can be more intentional about being more confident and just exuding more confidence with those that we work with and interact with. We've got an incredible guest with us today. We've got Heather Monahan. Heather is a best-selling author, keynote speaker, and founder of Boss and Heels. As the Chief Revenue Officer in Media, Heather is a Glass Ceiling Award winner, named one of the most influential women in radio in 2017, and Thrive, Thrive Global named her a limit-breaking female founder in 2018. Heather's new book, Confidence Creator, shot to number one on Amazon. Heather, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, Heather, we're here to talk about confidence and how we can be more intentional about exuding confidence. And I think maybe the first question to get started with is, what holds us back from getting what we want? I think that's the, the big thing with confidence is, is so often we're not thinking about the, the obstacles that, or really we're, we're so focused on the obstacles that stop us from being confident. What typically holds us back from getting what we want in life? A lack of confidence is definitely at the root of what holds people back from, you know, reaching their potential or going for what they really want, for sure. Well, how'd you get started in all this? How'd you get started working in just really boosting people's confidence? And, and really, I guess if you could share with us a story, I'd love to learn what was a fear-based conditioning maybe that you had in your life that maybe was holding you back and how'd you overcome it? Yeah, I was in corporate America for over 20 years, and I was in a leadership role as chief revenue officer. However, I had a peer on the executive team who was always trying to hold me down, always trying to sabotage me. You know, I essentially call it having a villain that you're working with in your space. And what happened over time is it was sort of like Chinese water torture. Very slowly, you don't notice it, but your confidence is slowly eroding because you're trying to shrink back or not get in an argument in a meeting or ignore poor behavior because you don't want to have an, yet again another issue with someone. And over a year, a year and a half, I had definitely been chipping away at my confidence. However, I wasn't consciously aware of it. And it took things getting really ugly at work. And this person really thriving from the fact that I was not speaking up and, and I was not calling her out on her poor behavior. And ultimately I recognized that something had changed, a dynamic had changed within me, not within her. And I decided I wanted to start working on my confidence and addressing what was an underlying issue that I hadn't been dealing with. That's awesome. I remember reading about that um, on one of your LinkedIn posts and I think it's so fascinating. We read books like Lean In and we read books about people being more confident at work and just empowering women and just other people that are like us at work. And when you see something like that, you think to yourself and you wonder why this is another woman who's pushing you down, not promoting you up and not empowering you to be your best self. Why do you think that was? Why do you think she wasn't supportive of you? Why do you think it almost seemed like she got her energy from you, from taking away yours? Why do you think that was? There's one thing people need to recognize, and this is universal. When you are a threat, you will always be the target. And that woman saw me as a threat and she was in this mode or focus that she wanted to get promoted. She wanted to elevate herself and she certainly saw me. I was definitely the other viable option to you know, be the next person to be promoted or, or to take whatever spotlight, you know, figuratively that she felt was out there. So at the root of that is really insecurity, because when you are confident as a leader, you're not threatened by other powerful, talented people. In fact, you welcome talented and successful people to be on your team and to challenge you to grow. And it, it was definitely that was not the case. So, you know, as an outsider looking in, no one can answer that question, but her. But to me, my opinion would be, she saw me as a threat. She saw me as the only threat as I was the only other female on um, the executive leadership team. Everyone else was males. And I was certainly very outspoken, very aggressive and very successful uh, in the time that we worked together. So I believe that she was threatened. And, you know, unfortunately, it, um, it all played out such that she ended up firing me when she got promoted to CEO, which was shortly thereafter. Um, she fired me immediately. Wow. 
that's fascinating. It's um, there's a lot that you can say there. I guess what I would love to kind of dig deeper into is deciphering when people are purposefully trying to sabotage you and when it's in our head, because I definitely can say that I've spoken with a lot of people and spoken to the other person on the other side of that. And they're like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. I was not, those were never my intentions, but it's almost like one action, maybe one email or one subtle comment that they don't think twice about because they're not thinking about how this potentially is impacting that other person really has a much larger effect on them. And they think this person is trying to sabotage me or, or hurt my ranks. How can we decipher between the difference? Have you ever or seen or experienced anything like that where perhaps sometimes it's in our head and not necessarily actually to be potentially true or that we maybe not confronted the person to have a conversation about why that might be or why we're having those feelings? Yeah, to me, it's irrelevant if it's a malicious intention or not, meaning it's all about you and how you receive things. So if you're receiving something that, oh my gosh, this person's sabotaging me or they're not responding to my emails or they're treating me badly, then it's on you to address it. It's on you to create the boundaries. It's on you to say, hey, I'm confused. Why are you treating me in this regard? And as you have a voice and stand up for yourself and have clear boundaries and teach others how to treat you, you'll know very quickly if that person made an honest mistake because they'll own it and say, wow, I can't believe you felt that way. You know, pump the brakes. Let's start over. What's a better way to communicate? I want to make sure I don't do this again. And then if that person moves forward and doesn't, you know that, you know, that was just a mistake or a miscommunication. However, there's plenty of people out there, especially in corporate America, in my experience, that will, for example, this woman was on the board of advocating for women, you know, advocating for women empowerment, had the t-shirt and everything. So she would never admit, oh, I don't return your emails because I'm trying to sabotage you and cause you problems. She would say, oh, yeah, huh, interesting. I didn't see that email. And I'd say, really, I put read receipt actually on everything I send you now because I, I'm really struggling with the miscommunication. On such and such date, you did receive it, you opened it. And then it would be, huh, okay. Don't know what happened. All right, let's move on. So then you know your your inner your inner voice and intuition is telling you this is BS. This is not you know it's not it's conflicting. The words don't match the actions. And when you start having those conversations, you know you are at the wrong place. You cannot you know work with people like that. So that's when you want to raise your hand and say I need to be moved to another team and or maybe you need to start looking for another job or start a side hustle and start creating a bridge move so that you can get yourself out of that situation. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's more consistent. I think a lot of people, I, I definitely have seen that quite often where if you feel like you've got conflict with somebody else and you actually bring up the thing that's frustrating you, I, I'm a big believer in uh, the power of nonviolent communication uh, by Marshall Rosenberg and just, you know, observation, feeling, need, request, and just bringing, just not being like, hey, you're a jerk, but like, hey, this is what happened. This is my feeling. This is my need. And this is my request. And when people kind of scuffle off of it, that's a great point. It's, it's typically they're not targeting you head on to say, hey, I really don't like you or I see you as a threat to me. It is they just kind of push you off. And that is a good indicator that perhaps you might not be in the right position or that more dialogue needs to be it, it needs needs to happen. Because, yeah, that, that's a really good point. How did you target this person? How did you target this one? What, or rather... What did you do? I, I, I know what you did after this, but could you share with our audience, what did you do after as a result from this um, disagreement when, when this woman had fired you from the role? So she called me over to her office, which was three hours away from my house. And I drove over there, still not thinking that she would fire me. Smart woman, you know, very high intelligence. And I, I never thought she would want to disrupt or sabotage the company in that regard, I was wrong. And so I walked into the meeting and she was very quick to say, I no longer need you. She was super happy. I'm getting rid of your position. We don't need a chief revenue officer. So, you know, you can either sign this memo or this one. And one memo said Heather Monahan's been fired. And the other one said Heather Monahan, after 14 years of service to our company is moving on and we're applauding her, blah, blah, blah. And I had been through meetings like this before. The company was always paranoid that someone would speak to what was going on inside, in the, inside the company. So they have you sign a release, which basically says you will never speak about anything about the company or any employees or share any information. And in exchange, they'll give you a big check to basically 
stay, stay quiet. And so it's a gag order, really. I had been working on my confidence. I had been thinking how, you know what, I'm standing up to this woman. And I had been standing up to her. I had launched a personal brand that last year when I was at the company. She had told me I had to shut it down. I refused to. I really was standing up for what I knew was right. And in my opinion, doing the right thing, regardless of what people around me thought. And in that moment, I said to her, I didn't sign either memo. I didn't write either memo. So why would I sign either? And if you don't have anything else to say, I'm on my way. And I took all of the power out of her and out of that room. I went, it was an interesting moment to see someone who was all smiles and very excited go to completely red in the face. And when you're able to stay calm in very stressful situations, you certainly disrupt the other person. And that's exactly what happened. And of course, once I got to my car, I cried the whole way home because I didn't know how I was going to pay my bills. I had a non-compete, non-solicit that I had to sign to accept my position as chief revenue officer, which essentially says for a year or a year and a half, I couldn't work in the media industry where I was an expert and had worked for over 20 years and had a great reputation. I couldn't you know, pull any of my employees that had worked for me. I couldn't, uh, there were so many restrictions. And that was a really scary time for me was leaving there and not knowing what I was going to do. And I'd only ever worked in corporate America. So it was, it certainly wasn't a moment where I left and said, Oh, I have a roadmap. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a book. And then I'm going to launch a speaking career. And then I'm going to launch a podcast. And I had no idea, you know, how the next few years would unfold. Heather, just what happened after that moment? You're crying, you're, you're driving home, you're crying. And then what was the pivot point for you? You gained your confidence, you gained your voice. You can't compete in the industry that you're in. How did you reinvent yourself? And looking in hindsight, was it probably like the best thing that ever happened to you? Yeah, it, you know, I hate to give her that credit, right? People always say, she did you such a favor. I'm like, oh, please, she treated me like crap and no one should treat anyone that way. But, you know, I am I probably wouldn't have had the confidence or the foresight to know I should go out on my own. I just always saw corporate America as this well-lit path. I knew I'd end up as CEO of a company in corporate America at some point. So if it wasn't going to be the one I was in, I'd pivot to another one. I just never looked outside of that bubble that I, I lived in. And I challenge people wherever you are, whatever industry, whatever will pick your head up out of that bubble and start looking how your talents and skill sets can apply outside of there. I was in a declining industry for over a decade and my job was to grow revenue. That's extremely difficult. I am no longer in a declining business. I'm in an industry that is growing and put yourself in the best position for yourself and for your talents instead of just where you happen to end up. I didn't think that way. Mm -hmm. So one of the first things I did that was really smart was I, first of all, I had invested in myself for a year. I had built a personal brand. So I had an audience and a community I could connect with. So if you haven't, launched a personal brand or been deliberate about creating community, do that now. Invest in yourself, take the time and make yourself a priority. So I had done that and now I was sitting on my couch crying and noticing no one was calling me. And I thought, this is crazy. I know thousands of people. Why does no one care? And then I said, wait a minute, she's not telling anyone. There's no press release going out. They don't want anyone to know. So I did something that everyone told me was ridiculous and insane. I posted, I just got fired and I really need your help. And I don't know what I'm going to do, but if I've ever helped you over the last 14 years, I really need to hear from you today. And my friends called me and said, take that post down. It looks so weak and pathetic. And I said, no, something inside me tells me this is the right thing for me to do. If they don't know I've been fired, no one can help me. And thousands of people came to help. And, and one of those people was Froggy from the Elvis Duran show. He tweeted at me hey, I've been following you. I want to help you any way that I can. And I also learned if someone extends an olive branch to you, grab that branch. Don't say, oh, I'll go back and check on that branch in a couple of months when I have more time. Those people will have moved on and that offer will be gone. So I tweeted right back, great, get me on the Elvis Duran show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he tweeted back, okay. So he wasn't you know, thinking I was going to do that, but he did follow through. He got me on the show. And within a couple of weeks, I was out in New York and I was on the show, petrified, didn't know what I was going to say. And halfway through the interview, Elvis said, well, obviously you're writing a book, Heather. And I said, well, obviously, but I wasn't. And he, in that moment, someone so far ahead of me, someone so much more successful than I was, transferred his confidence in me to me. Mm -hmm. And I took it on. And I got on that plane to leave New York. And I Googled, how do you write a book? And it said, 
you know, because I was the sales one and the social one. I wasn't the intellectual one growing up or I wasn't an English major for sure. Mm -hmm. And so I Googled it and basically it said, you just have to sit down and write and be disciplined. And I thought, I can do that. I'm, I have nothing else to do all day now that I've been fired. So I just sat down and started writing. And within a week, I knew I was writing about confidence and I knew I was creating a blueprint for others so that they wouldn't have to feel as bad as I did in that low moment. I wanted to set them up and other people up for success and actually take myself through reminding myself, hang on, you've been here before. Like, what are the steps you're going to take? How are you going to bounce back? And writing that book was the craziest experience. And I launched the book and it trumped Trump for number one on the business biography list the first week that it came out. It was crazy. That's wow. amazing. I That's love what I love so much about within your story is it's very clear. It's not like you were born this way. I think a lot of people tell themselves like, Oh, I can't write a book or I can't do this or I can't do that. They come in with his own mental BS conditioning for why they can't do something. And I love how you talked about that. You said, well, I'm not an intellectual one. I've always been the sales one. I'm not, I, I don't, I, I don't have the, the focus or whatever to write a book. And you, you did your own research. You just did it. And that's so often is the first step is just to do it and try it. And sure, you might fall flat on your face a couple of times. You might go down a rabbit hole that you end up realizing isn't going to be a part of the book. But the fact that you had to go down that rabbit hole to realize that it's not part of the book was a necessary key. It was just like by getting fired, kind of like what Tori had alluded to, by getting fired, that opened up your world to the opportunity of where you're at right now. And it's more or less the point is you can't grow unless you're uncomfortable. Yeah. And the three lessons around the point that you're making is number one, there are no lanes. Don't, I was putting myself in a sales lane. This is the only thing I could do. I live lanelessly now. I am an author. I'm a speaker. I'm a podcast host. I'm going to, who knows what I'm going to do next, but I'll do something completely outside of what I'm doing. Cause I live lanelessly and you should too. But mm -hmm. for you know, 25 years, I lived in one specific lane and I never looked beyond it. So blow up the lanes and live lanelessly. It is so much more rewarding and you grow so much more. So that's one to that point. The other thing is, you know, don't take direction from someone who hasn't been where you want to go. That happens to a lot of people, meaning your family might say, you really shouldn't write a book. You're really good in corporate America. Just, you know, hang tight, start interviewing. Don't take that advice, right? If your family hasn't written 19 books, don't look to them for advice on that. Thank them for it and hand the advice back. And then instead, call an editor who's written 19 books and say, hey, what do you think about this? And brainstorm with someone who is way beyond where you want to go. And they'll say, yeah, you should totally do it. Go for it. Like, yeah, I remember the first book I did. Go, like, start writing. So don't take advice from people who haven't been where you want to go. And the other thing is, get in touch with that story you're telling yourself that's holding you back. For me, I grew up with a very intelligent sister. She was the smart one. I was the social one. You know, we were called these separate things. So my whole life, I was telling me, I was unaware I was doing it. Oh, I'm not smart enough for that. No, oh, that's for the intelligent ones. I'll just go to the social things where I can talk to people. Little did I know you can be social and smart at the same time. Who knew? Nobody told me that, right? So, or I never told myself that. So I had to get clear on, I'm not going to live in lanes. I'm not going to label myself anymore. I can be the social one who also is able to write a book. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I love those three tips. Those are fantastic. Like for anybody watching this, rewind the last like minute and a half. Heather gave some gold three tips of what you should do to start really getting out of your own mental BS conditioning of for what's holding you back from getting what you want and really getting starting on the path of confidence. On another note to confidence, I'd love to learn your thoughts on this. What are your thoughts on physical state and the story you tell yourself? I mean, we kind of, you talked a little bit about this from like, don't put yourself in a lane. That's part of the story. But from a physical state perspective, how important is your physical body being in a state conducive for being successful? Like the difference between me being slunched over versus me being in good posture, walking into a room with energy and, and positivity. How does that help with my confidence or anybody's confidence for that matter when they're in a scenario where they want to be or need to be confident? Oh my, it's huge, huge. I can't, and again, it'll vary for different people, right? Because Everyone has different triggers or things that work better for them than, you know, other things. For me, that is flipping huge. And a great story to illustrate this is I gave my first TEDx talk a year ago right now. And I practiced for it. I was prepared for it. 
And that morning of, I went out there and I looked more like this. I didn't, you know, I, I didn't do my hair. I didn't have my outfits done yet because I had plenty of time hours before our event. So I was just, you know, my hair was wet and I just walked in kind of casual. And they said, hey, do us a favor and jump up on stage, Heather. I said, sure. I jump up and they said, give your speech. And in that moment, I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm not, I haven't done my hair and my makeup. I don't have my power color on. And I, I didn't write on the bottom of my shoes, my whole routine that really helps me be so powerful. So I said, I'll try. And I bombed. I completely froze about one minute in and it's a 10 minute talk. And they thought I was kidding and I wasn't kidding. And he said, oh, you know what? That's good enough for sound check. You, you can jump off. Don't worry. And I jumped off and a woman said to me, wow, you just really blew it. And I said, I'm leaving right now and I'll be back once I'm ready. And ready for me meant I needed my hair done. I wanted my makeup done. I wanted my power blue dress on. I needed my heels that are my go-to power heels that say I can and I will on the bottom. I need to listen to my playlist, which is my thug life rap music that I listen to anytime I'm going into something really scary. I listen to this playlist and by doing it with repetition, whenever I'm going into something big, it reminds me, oh, I remember that event. I crushed it. I remember that event. I crushed it. I was scared. I crushed it. So it starts to make me think you're going to crush this. So I do this whole routine and I came back to the venue now physically in a, a way in a state that I knew I had a really good chance of succeeding. I wasn't positive because I had blown it that morning and that had never happened to me, but I did feel physically much more prepared and standing tall and strong. And in the way that I knew I was going, I had been seeing it in my mind for months of me walking on the stage, looking the way I looked then, not the way I looked in the morning. I was a first speaker and I was right behind the stage and they said to me, okay, Heather, you're going on now. And someone handed me lavender. Oh, here's some, I always have lavender. It's a way to, for me to get centered and calm in any moment when I'm really nervous. And I sniffed that lavender and I closed my eyes and I said, if you don't walk out there right now, you will never forgive yourself. If you walk out there and blow it, I will be so proud of you. And I opened my eyes and I just started walking out. To this day, I don't remember the first two minutes of that speech. I don't remember it all because that's how scared I was. However, I was able to execute so well on my talk because I was in the proper physical state. I was in the proper mental state and I had done so much work preparing for it that I really blanked out. I, I don't remember, but I had done all the other right things to set myself up to kill that speech. And I did, and I'm so proud of it. And that's so powerful. That repetition, you, 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 one, you talk about a lot of things. One, you talk about neuro-linguistic programming, just essentially we anchor our brains to certain smells, to certain activities, to certain actions. I know Tori and I, whenever we're working with somebody and we like get a sale, we sniff this, uh, it was on Shark Tank, they call it boom, boom, these boom, boom sticks, and they have a certain smell. And essentially we associate that smell with success. Um, I also know like there are certain smells that you have maybe when you're growing up, maybe it's the smell of uh, for me, it's like fertilizer during spring. It makes me think like, oh, the leaves are coming out or the, you know, the, the field, the, I don't know, the greens are changing and it's making me feel good because I know that sun, summer's coming and that sort of stuff. But the point is, is that we anchor our brains to certain smells, certain activities, certain tastes, and they make us feel good or they can, they, they either serve us or they don't serve us. But the more repetition we have and getting ourselves into a physical state that is being reinforced by some sort of, some sort of stimulus it allows us to get into that state. And so for you, it's obviously lavender and um, just that practice and your, your heels and your dress and just getting yourself into that, that physical state. But also, I know I've seen this, you've got these LinkedIn workout videos and you're getting yourself physically into a state prepared for any form of activity or action, um, which I think are awesome because you don't really see them on LinkedIn all that often, that being people working out. And I think it's super cool that you do that. Yeah, well, I read a year ago, I read an article, I don't remember anymore where I found the article, but it was basically talking about Beyonce and how she prepared for her huge special she did on Netflix or whatever. And it, it was physically so grueling. But what they likened it to was when she is in exceptional cardio shape, she's able to sing from a different place in her body than if she wasn't in that level of physical conditioning. And they likened it to speakers. And they talked about how if speakers, keynote speakers are out of shape, their voice is coming from and their power is coming from a different place than it would be if you were really conditioned. And once I heard that, I thought, 
oh, heck no, I am never going to not kill a speech because I could have been running more or working out harder. That's an easy fix. And I just remember from that day reading that article, I thought, you know what, push myself and go harder physically if it's going to help me with my job, which ultimately helps me with my revenue and helps me to show up and be a better version of myself. Yeah, that's awesome. I know Tori's a big believer in that. Tori rides like 200 miles on her bike every weekend. She's pretty incredible. Mm, I do. <laughs> Gets me centered for me. It's my center. It's where my ideas flow. It's where I'm creative is when I have that. It's like the vinyasa breath, not through meditation, but through being grounded to the earth, grounded to nature, grounded to people. And uh, I believe so strongly in it. So um, I had a question though, Heather, um, back to the the about women in, in work, why do you think women in power, and it's funny because it's women in power, are insecure with, with other women in power? Like, why are we as women not supporting one another? Why are we doing this to one another? Because I'm sure if you were a man with the same qualifications and incredibly good looking, and as a man, that, that might not have been, that probably would not have intimidated this CEO. Why? I, I just believe that when someone's threatened by you, when a woman who has some level of insecurity is threatened by you, they are going to come all out for you. I, I've seen it. However, I've seen the flip side when you're dealing with really confident, you know, strong people, women, and I've seen this so much since I went out on my own, so many women who are beautiful, successful, and far ahead of me have come to support me and cheer me on and are not threatened by me at all, could care less. They, you know, there's success for everyone, Heather, you're different than me, don't worry, I'm, I don't view you as a competitor. Those are the people that you want to surround yourself with. So it isn't always by a title or a paycheck that you can gather, oh, I bet that person's confident. No. Sometimes it's a complete opposite, the person that is making the most money in the company and looks perfect. You know, those are the ones you want to run from. If someone's trying to pretend they're perfect, that person is definitely rooted in some insecurity. And I say, hit the bricks, get away from them, do whatever it takes to, to run away. Because you want to find the people that accept flaws and aren't challenged or afraid of really talented people being around them. And if you observe and pay attention, you'll see it very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think sometimes women that um, rise to higher positions can be have that imposter complex where maybe they didn't quite get there because maybe it's because their dad ran the company or they knew someone. And so when they get to these levels of power, they're not really, they, they lash out or they become defensive or insecure because they don't really feel like they've earned it. The women that you kind of have described that have rallied to support you seem like they've, they're women who have really rolled up their sleeves and, and paved that road for themselves, regardless of getting support from anyone else or actually because, probably because they didn't get support from anyone else. So they're fully confident that I earned every step that I took to get here. Possibly, you think? So I don't agree with that. And, and I'll tell you why, because I can only speak from my own personal experience. Yeah. I was the person who, I pitched myself for VP of sales. I pitched myself for EVP. I pitched myself for CRO. But on the day when I actually got those jobs, I was petrified. I thought, oh my God, what did I just do to myself? I push, push and push and now I've got it. Am I going to be smart enough to be in that room? Am I going to be able to deliver? Am I going to be exposed as this young kid that grew up poor that doesn't know what the heck she's doing? And then when I went on my own, is I, how can I say I'm an entrepreneur? I'm not qualified as an entrepreneur. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Anytime I go into a new level, I doubt myself. I have imposter syndrome and I've worked my butt off from, I come from nothing from growing up on food stamps. So for me, I don't know anyone that works as hard as me. I truly don't. And I've always been that way. But every time I push myself to that next level, I think I don't deserve it. And what I've learned for me, and again, I can only speak to me and everyone is different. There is not one prescription I could write for someone to say, here's confidence. There you go. No, your issues are different than mine. And that's why people have to dig in for themselves and do the work on themselves. But for me, I was more confident in work, always have been. It's just kind of been my thing that I feel more confident. I haven't always been confident in relationships. I haven't always been confident with myself and my own inner feelings. I haven't always been confident at the gym. There's been ups and downs. So in different places, you can have different levels of confidence. And when I would be in work, I'd be more confident there. So I'd push, push, push for what I wanted. But when I'd actually get it and realize I was stepping into something new, 
the lack of confidence I had in all these other areas revealed themselves and I would show up doubting me. And it was just through taking the action and moving forward that I was able to overcome it. And now that I look back, as I've grown, you know, here I am 46 years old, I'm able to say I'm really much more confident in most areas, still not everything. I'm certainly not, you know, there. I don't think anyone ever does get there, but, you know, I'm, I'm certainly a lot better than I used to be. So when I do step into, when I launch my, my podcast, I didn't have that whole imposter syndrome. I didn't. And it was one of the first times I was like, oh, look at you. You're showing up and you're going for it and you're not freaking out this time. But it took me finally realizing that that doubt, even though I didn't have it in work, it was jumping into my head from these other places within me that I hadn't been working on yet. And there's a certain exhilaration in that of trying something new and feeling that and knowing that, but being happy and excited about it. You almost look forward to that new exhilaration of that roller coaster, like going over the edge um, for some new thing that you're doing. And um, the first time even thinking about going over that edge, you think I couldn't possibly do this. This is way too crazy. And then after you've done it a few times, you think I can do anything. If I really put my mind to it, we can try it and shoot. The first time I put it out there, I might fall flat on my face, but the second, the third, the fourth time, they're going to get much better. And I know the sooner I try, the sooner I fall on my face, the sooner I am going to be better at doing it than had I tried to be perfectionist from day one, because there's no such thing as perfect. You're never going to be perfect, especially not on day one. Yeah. And, and that's why now when I look back, I, I was fired three years ago and I had to go through this whole roller coaster of doubting myself and not knowing what I was going to do. And then writing a book and then launching a speaking career and then launching a podcast and then doing a TED talk. And then the pandemic hits and I lose everything. And what I realize now is I just had three years jump start on everybody else because that uncertainty and that fear, I don't, Hey, I, I, I've been doing that now for three years. So for me, when it happened, I thought, okay, put a post up. You don't have any money coming in now. All your speaking engagements are canceled. People ask you for coaching and consulting, put a post up. And I wasn't scared. And I went right to my computer and I put a post up. And I said, you've asked, I've answered, launching my first ever executive coaching and consulting business. DM me if you want to work with me. Did I had no idea about that, what that would look like. I just knew take action and believe in yourself. And I wasn't scared and I wasn't nervous and I didn't procrastinate on it because I've had these three years of learning to step into fear and see that there's a very fine line between fear and excitement, but I've got to step into it and see it as a green light. That means go and go faster. That's awesome. Heather, this has been an incredible lunch and learn. I have loved 